Uh, first, we have Lloyd Torrens. He's from IEC, Independent Environmental Consultants. Uh, he has over 40 years of experience in environmental management planning and development uh, across a, a variety of sectors and contexts, including transportation, oil and gas, power, uh, mining and waste management. And he, he uh, has extensive experience in the development of and implementation of environmental management systems, preparing environmental management plans, and applying best management practices. Uh, he, for the better part of his career, was with uh, SNC-Lavalin. Uh, he was there, I believe, for 39 years, if I'm not mistaken, Lloyd. And uh, Lloyd's going to kick us off uh, this morning with some background, but I won't give, uh, give away his presentation. Um, over to you, Lloyd. Uh, thank you, Kate. Oops. As Kate mentioned, I am uh, a senior affiliate with uh, IEC, Environmental Independent Consultants, and I specialized in environmental and social impact assessments, permitting, and environmental management in particular. To give you a little bit of background on IEC, Independent Environmental Consultants is an employee-owned uh, environmental consulting company that provides expertise in environmental science, engineering, planning, and strategic advice to clients across Canada and around the world. Our team has worked extensively with municipalities, private sector companies, industrial associations, First Nations, public interest groups, law firms, regulatory agencies, and all levels of government. We have a diverse group of senior level consultants with 25 to 45 years of experience in consulting, government, and industry. Today, um, what I'm gonna do is talk, give you some background on environmental events that have occurred uh, in the last 60 years. This particular slide shows how event events have um, essentially transpired over the 60 year period and the increase in frequency by type. Flood, thunderstorms and wildfires, for example, have increased significantly in the last uh, 30 years or so. This is common around the world. Oops. In terms of the environmental events, uh, what I'm going to do is talk about the environmental crises that have occurred in terms of natural events, the disasters associated with them, and then I'm going to talk later about industrial uh, incidents that have occurred, uh, particularly associated with infrastructure. The environmental crises, natural events, uh, the first one I'll mention is Hurricane Hazel. Hurricane Hazel occurred in 1954. The Toronto area received 225 millimeters of rain over a 36 to 40 hour period. The hurricane began uh, when it reached uh, uh, landfall in the US. It was a category four hurricane and it was to degrade to a category one. It was assumed it would further degrade to a, a tropical depression. The result of that uh, event was 81 deaths, 1800 uh, and 68 homeless people in Toronto, and 3,000 homeless in the Holland Marsh area. 20 major bridges in the Toronto area were destroyed, and another 40 were structurally damaged. The, it affected the Humber River and Etobicoke Creek areas, and particularly the uh, communities of Woodbridge, Weston, and Long Branch. The estimated costs at the time were $137 million dollars. In 209 dollars, that would be 1.1 billion. The importance of uh, Hurricane Hazel is that, that set the stage for floodplain regulation in Ontario. Um, immediately following that, there was the establishment of the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, and then there were 35 other conservation authorities established in Ontario. The next event occurred in southern Ontario, there was a tornadoes outbreak in 1985. There were 14 tornadoes that day affecting the area north of Toronto. The most significant one 
was, uh, or there were two significant tornadoes. The Barry tornado was an F4. It had a path 10 kilometers long and 600 meters wide. Eight people were killed, 150 uh, people were injured, and 300 homes were destroyed. The second tornado at that time was Grand Valley to Mount Albert. It had a path of 100 kilometers, 200 meters wide. It's the longest Canadian uh, tornado uh, path on record, I believe. The estimated cost at the time for that was $393 million. The next one is the Winnipeg flood. It affected the Assiniboine, Red, and, Wet and Winnipeg rivers. 700 personnel from the military were involved in assisting in flood prevention um, and, and damage control. 25,000 uh, were evacuated and 17 communities were affected. The estimated cost for that was $498 uh, million. The breakdown was roughly, uh, half of it was paid by insurance, half of it was, was through um, the um, financial uh, uh, agreement. Sl the Slave Lake fire uh, in uh, May um, 2011, resulted in um, impacts on several communities in Northern Alberta. 49 wildfires uh, prompted the evacuation of Penn West Petroleum, Exalt Energy Corp, and Canadian Natural Resources Limited operations. Over 12,000 people were evacuated and the CN rail line in the area was closed for a period of time. The Toronto flood in July, uh, 2013, that was a thunderstorm that dropped 126 millimeters of precipitation in the greater Toronto area on average. In some areas, it was up to 175 millimeters. It caused extensive damage to um, the existing transportation corridors and uh, um, caused widespread property damage. It disrupted approximately 300,000 residents. The Insurance Bureau of Canada estimated the flooding caused $940 million worth of property damage. The Southern Alberta flood in June 2013 obviously caused heavy rainfall flooding in Southern Alberta, particularly affecting Canmore, Calgary, High River, and nine other municipalities. Four people were killed and significant disruptions were experienced to um, power, telecommunications, clean water supply, and transportation corridors. Approximately um, 100,000 people were evacuated. Damage was estimated at $6 billion in terms of interim costs, um, and $1.9 billion are estimated to be covered on insurance. This um, disaster also um, resulted in um, a reduction of $550 million in GDP. The Southern Ontario, uh, Greater Toronto Area Winter Ice Storm occurred in December 2013. It was a severe storm, freezing rain, and damaging ice accumulation. The epicenter was in Southern Ontario along the North Shore of Lake Ontario. It included the greater Toronto area. It was also complicated by the fact that following the ice storm, the temperatures dropped significantly. The estimated cost for this was $164 million. The Southern Manitoba flood that occurred in 2014, it followed a period of uh, generally quiet spring flood runoff but it had heavy rainfall. There was 200 millimeters of rain. Um, they had to open the portage diversion and let water out into um, Lake Manitoba. Over 920,000 acres of farmland went unseeded for the 2014 season. This represented 25% of the arable land in Manitoba. 
at, with an estimated cost of $1 billion. The Fort McMurray wildfire forced 90,000 people from their homes and about 2,400 buildings were uh, burned. Restoration work for this particular event is, is multifaceted and unique. It presents challenges for government services, environmental cleanups, reconstruction planning, insurers, and all the affected population and businesses involved. The preliminary costs, according to the Insurance Bureau of Canada, is $3.6 billion. 27,000 in personal property insurance claims, averaging $81,000. 250,000 in commercial property claims, averaging 250,000. And 12,000 in auto claims, averaging 15,000. Now I'm going to move from the natural events to industrial events. The first one is the Mississauga train derailment. That happened in November 1979. It was a CP rail car of 106 uh, cars carrying many dangerous chemicals that derailed in Mavis Road in Mississauga. It burst into flames and created a gigantic explosion. The proximity of the tank car containing chlorine to the propane tanks raised concern. Fears were that it, it may have exploded and released a toxic cloud of chlorine, forcing the evacuation of 225,000 people. In actual fact, the um, chlorine car did rupture. There was an initial release. Um, they think that the um, explosion essentially was so hot uh, from the fire that the chlorine that was initially released dissipated over a large area and didn't have a, a, a big effect. However, Dow Chemical were involved for a period of about six days trying to patch the tank before they could actually transfer the remaining chlorine uh, away from the site. The Timmins train fuel spill, that occurred in March 1986. Between 4 and 5,000, 4,500 and 5,000 people were evacuated from their homes. A railway tank car was offloading at the Imperial Oil Storage Depot. It leaked 21,000 liters of gasoline into the storm sewers and sanitary sewers. Gas fumes resulted in several explosions and the complete destruction of two homes. I believe there were fires to about seven other homes in the area. The sewer system had to be ventilated over 24 to 48 hours. The, um, were, there were no uh, documented costs uh, on that uh, event. And in the records that I could just, um, find, it was difficult to find uh, what the impact was in terms of the sewage treatment facility or the release to the local water course. The Sunrise propane uh, event occurred in August 20, uh, 2008. There was a series of explosions at North York Sunrise Propane Industrial Gas Plant that forced the evacuation of 12,000 people living in a 1.6 kilometer radius of the area. That 1.6 kilometer radius also included Highway 401. So the highway was closed down for a period of time. There was a 25 year experienced veteran of the Toronto Fire Service who died in the aftermath of the explosion trying to, uh, to uh, fight some of the fire activity. The estimated cleanup for that um, was arrived at and it was roughly $7.9 million and it was distributed um, to the um, 6,000 affected residents, the City of Toronto and the insurance company. And Kate in her presentation in a few minutes will discuss things further. Now, in looking at the events that we've said, or that I've just mentioned, there are a number of environmental and social issues that these events raise. And the people involved in that in the different communities across the country and the different government agencies have responded in different ways. Infrastructure and risk assessments and vulnerability assessments, for example, have been carried out. Hydro systems and networks have been analyzed. Flood risk updates have been considered. 
Riverine floodplain mapping have been up, has been updated. In some neighborhoods, um, storm drainage system assessments for overland flooding have been done, particularly to try to reduce the impact on uh, basement flooding. Telecommunication systems and networks have also been upgraded to some degree. The environmental effect and event forecasting and warning systems are continually being improved and this is an ongoing effort that will continue into the future. Design and permit approvals will also be modified in light of the risk and vulnerability assessments. Ongoing climatic studies, there's a wealth of research going on in terms of government sponsored research, climate change action plans, university research. In some cases, local universities, municipalities and government agencies have worked together and created climate research consortiums. There's an, an extensive exchange of information going on through the federal and provincial agencies, through NGOs, Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And it's not just limited to research here in Canada. The whole issue of climate change is bringing a lot of international expertise together on it. One of the things that a lot of effort has been looking at is biodiversity and the ha habitat adaptation that climate change will force. For example, in 2050, the environment here in Toronto may be much more similar to the area of, of Washington, D.C. as a comparison. Environmental management systems uh, in all of these crises, uh, moving forward, environmental management systems are important in terms of effective ongoing maintenance considerations and monitoring, inspections of facilities. The application of best management practices is also an important aspect of moving forward. We need to coordinate emergency response protocols, emergency response plans, and training programs. In terms of environmental management systems, one of the most important aspects is development, developing effective community awareness and education programs. The other thing that is happening or has happened as a result of uh, these different events is over time, there has been a series of planning and functional guidance doc documents prepared by various agencies, and groups involved in these various crises as a way of moving forward and learning uh, from the mistakes that have occurred. There's obviously a need, or some uh, design guidelines have been uh, revised. There's going to be a need, particularly in the future with climate change, to update building codes and, and building standards. Operational procedures and management plans will change for individual operators of various infrastructure structures or, for, or facilities. Planning and land use guideline tools are going to have to adapt. Um, there have been several planning guidelines produced by municipalities across the country um, under um, and some of them have been coordinated to the through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. The and uh, a series of uh, adaptation handbooks have been prepared by different organizations. Uh, for example, um, uh, backwater flow valves, and instructing people and property owners what to do uh, to re um, also reduce downspouts in, in terms of this from the sewer system. Uh, these are the kind of things that handbooks cover. Environmental best management practices, the uh, various municipalities are incorporating these into various mitigation plans that they've established developing adaptation measures on that for stormwater management, for example. Uh, property landscaping and drainage guidelines are also being produced. Uh, and the province of Alberta has produced um, a fire smart uh, set of guidelines in terms of, la of um, uh, landscaping uh, guidelines. Climate change and uh, adaptation and resiliency plans are going to have to be developed at the provincial and municipal level. In terms of federal, provincial, and municipal financial assistance programs, focus is going to have to be put towards conservation improvements and infrastructure improvements. One of the issues as we um, uh, look at this down the road is who's essentially going to pay for this given the uh, federal, provincial, and municipal stakeholders. 
Liability issues are obviously a major issue. Insurance claims and settlements are going to change over time as interpretation of risk change. Due diligence issues are going to come into play in terms of certain government authorities. Have government agencies done enough in certain instances when crises happen? Uh, a lot of citizens and that um, you know are wondering uh, why are they getting flooded? Um, you know, so in terms of awareness, um, are the municipalities uh, maintaining things appropriately uh, to avoid uh, liability issues? Environmental audits are going to become a major consideration as uh, um, liabilities are, are investigated. Emergency and crisis management planning, which Alex will talk about a little later, uh, will become increasingly important. Financial investors on that will be looking at asset management. When you're going to invest in infrastructure projects, what are the risks associated with those projects, particularly with climate change? Funding sources for both public and private investments will be significant. People are going to be wanting to know uh, where their investments are and what the risks are associated with them. Disaster risk modeling will also be uh, a major consideration. Key considerations for moving forward. It's going to be prudent for business and policymakers to start thinking of long-term implications and place a larger emphasis on natural or human catastrophes when making investment decisions. Businesses need to identify how these events may impact them and adjust long-term financial plans accordingly, particularly with regard to the frequency and magnitude of the events that may be experienced. Governments need to take a close look at their inventory of infrastructure to identify vulnerabilities and areas where proactive adaptation can prevent future damages, loss of life, or economic disruptions. Awareness and preparation is the first step towards ensuring safety of people, property, and the prosperity of the economy. With that, I'll conclude my discussion. And I thank you on behalf of IEC. I'll turn it back to Kate. Uh, thank, thank you, Lloyd, for uh, setting the stage for us. I, I certainly took a few uh, themes out of that, uh, that discussion. I think we, it's fair to say that there's uh, increased frequency and magnitude of the types of events uh, that can cause uh, or, or that lead to a crisis. Uh, Increased pressure on insurance. It sounds like uh, it's certainly the we. I think we know that uh, the insurance available to to address some of these crises and the financial impacts is at least we saw in the Alberta flood case, uh, perhaps uh, not entirely in line with the events that we're now seeing. We're seeing regulatory change, an increase in public uh, awareness. All of these things are going to be part of what all of us in, in this room are going to need to adapt to and, and be thinking about as we move forward. Uh, next, what we're going to do is Meredith James, an environmental lawyer here at Denton's in our uh, Toronto office, is going to do a deeper dive into the Sunrise propane uh, event that Lloyd mentioned uh, and talk about uh, how that crisis unfolded and the implications and impacts as they moved on. Just a little bit about Meredith, other than she is an environmental lawyer in our Toronto office. Um, she has a, a background in environmental biology and she worked with Environmental Canada for a number of years before she went to law school. Before she joined us here at Denton's uh, just over a year ago, uh, she worked for four years with Diane Sachs. Some of you might have heard of her. So she has uh, quite the pedigree in terms of her environmental background. And we like to think we've augmented that here at Denton's. Um, she practices across all areas of environmental law, including regulatory compliance, permitting and approval, contaminated sites work, uh, spill and spills, defense of prosecutions, and civil litigation. So with that, I will turn it over to Meredith, who will walk us through Sunrise Propane. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the nice introduction, Kate. Uh, down here. Oh. here we go. 
So as, as Lloyd discussed, environmental crises can arise unexpectedly and have devastating physical, social, and economic impacts. The focus of my presentation is on the legal liabilities and obligations that can arise following a crisis like this. Uh, the key takeaway message is uh, that the costs associated with liability under environmental laws can be enormous. Cleanup obligations imposed through administrative orders can easily be in the millions of dollars. Fines for non-compliance with environmental laws vary in part based on the severity of the environmental harm. So where there's been an incident where there's been a significant damage to the environment, fines can easily reach the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Directors and officers can be personally liable for both administrative orders and violations of environmental law. And your neighbors, if they are homes and businesses are damaged, can sue you in civil litigation. Uh, and the combination of the cost of dealing with the aftermath of a major environmental incident combined with the business disruption and reputational impacts can be so severe that the business can't continue. I'll be using the case of Sunrise Propane to illustrate these issues. You may be familiar with the 2008 explosion, and as Lloyd mentioned, it was absolutely enormous. Um, it's a good example of where everything went wrong for the defendants. The Ministry of the Environment issued an environmental order against the company following the explosion. The company was prosecuted for failing to comply with that order and also for other environmental offenses. The directors were also charged, and the neighbors launched a major civil class action with, against numerous defendants. I won't go into this in too much detail because Lloyd has already touched on it, but I wanted to provide a little more context here. So the, the propane explosion occurred just after 3 o'clock in the morning, and the surrounding residents woke up to their windows, doors being blown in by the force of the explosion. Uh, it was about a 1.6 kilometer radius around the facility was evacuated in the middle of the night because of the risk of continuing explosions. Uh, and tragically, an employee at the site uh, during the explosion was killed uh, in part because he did not have the adequate emergency response training. The uh, eyewitness account is that he actually ran towards the, uh, the propane vapor a cloud, not knowing what to do. He just panicked and ran towards it and was, was killed. Um, yeah. There were some warning signs of safety issues at Sunrise Propane, in particular with respect to the truck-to-truck -truck transfers of propane, which was what occurred at the time of the explosion. Um, the TSSA had specifically prohibited these, this type of transfer in 2006 and warned Sunrise that it could not continue making truck-to-truck -truck transfers. The TSSA also identified a number of other issues at the site, including employee training. Or lack of, or lack thereof. Immediately following the explosion, numerous agencies responded in an attempt to prevent further explosions and harm to the community as well as assess the scope of the damage, put out the fires. Um, as you can imagine, this re resulted in a very chaotic and fast-moving situation. The fire marshal took over the site and restricted access. And there was initially a search for the missing employee whose body was eventually recovered. Sunrise was a member of the Ontario Propane Association, which provided a number of services to its members, including an emergency response action plan. This was based on mutual aid, where if an explosion or another incident happened at one company, other companies would assist in the response. Through that plan, HASCO Environmental would either respond or coordinate the response. So HASCO did respond on August 10th, um, and then on August 11th, they identified uh, asbestos contamination, which had been blown throughout the community. I read one account where the asbestos dust had actually been ground into the carpets of some of the houses where all of their windows and doors had been blown in. Uh, Sunrise initially instructed HASCO to deal with whatever cleanup it was responsible for. Uh, but HASCO was later unable to get written confirmation from Sunrise that they would be paid for their work on the site. When HASCO told the Ministry of the Environment um, that they were uncertain whether they would be able to continue their work at the site, the provincial officer became concerned that their work would not continue, and so they, they, she issued a cleanup order against Sunrise. The Ministry of the Environment, as I'm sure many of you already know, has extensive order-making powers. These orders can be issued against those who own, manage, or control a property or undertaking, or who own or control a pollutant that has been spilled. 
Uh, these orders can include preventive, pre preventative and remedial measures both on and off site. And the grounds for the issuing the order are broadly speaking based on environmental protection or preventing and addressing environmental harm. That means that they're not necessarily fault based. Innocent flow through property owners can be issued orders and owners who, prop owners who purchase the property after it was contaminated can also be issued these kinds of remedial orders. Uh, these orders can be appealed to the Environmental Review Tribunal. However, substantial costs can still accrue during that appeal process. There is no automatic stay when an order is appealed to the ERT, and the ERT doesn't have the authority to stay in order where the, that stay would jeopardize human health, the environment, or property. So it's very limited um, discretion that the ERT has where it's going to be able to stay in order. In Sunrise Propane's case, uh, the cleanup order imposed a very heavy compliance burden. There was very short timelines. Some of the compliance um, obligations were, were, took effect immediately. Uh, one was effect, effective 22 minutes after the order was served on Sunrise Propane. It had a very broad scope. Uh, the order required cleanup of debris in a one kilometer radius around the site. Uh, it was potentially very costly. Sunrise at the time argued that it had significant financial constraints uh, due to uh, that the insurance company hadn't yet paid out, uh, given them the funds to respond to the cleanup, and they, so they said, we don't have the money to comply. And it was also difficult to comply with respect to the cleanup of the site itself because the fire marshals still had, uh, had restricted access. So, so Sunrise failed to pro comply with, with that order. Uh, although its legal counsel was in communication with the Ministry of the Environment, it did not request any extensions of the deadlines. It also did not appeal the order to the Director of the Ministry of the Environment or the Environmental Review Tribunal. Uh, and as a result, the City of Toronto took over the cleanup, which took approximately 10 days to complete at a cost of 2.8 million. This is a bit different number from what Lloyd said, uh, that number is taken from the claim that the City of Toronto eventually made against Sunrise for compensation for the cost of the cleanup. So as a result of this non-compliance with the order and the explosion itself, Sunrise was, uh, and to, as well as two of its directors, were charged with offenses under the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, discharge of a contaminant causing an adverse effect failure to comply with the order, and the directors were charged for failing to fulfill their duties under the Environmental Protection Act to ensure that the company complied with the environmental order. So fines under the Environmental Protection Act can be very high, and the trend is that they are increasing. Uh, this is particularly the case where there has been significant, significant harm to the environment or to the community. Uh, although less serious offenses don't carry minimum fines, they do allow for a maximum fine of $250,000 on a first offense, which rises to a maximum of $500,000 on subsequent offenses. Uh, more serious offenses, including the discharge of a contaminant causing an adverse effect, uh, carry minimum fines and significantly higher maximum fines. For example, on a first offense, the minimum fine is $25,000 and the maximum is $6 million. Both of these increase with every subsequent offense. It's also important to note that these fines can be imposed for each day on which the offense or the contravention occurred or continued, and that the total fine is subject to a 25% victim fine surcharge, which can be a very unpleasant surprise for defendants. At trial, uh, Sunrise attempted to raise a number of defenses, including that it was impossible to comply with the order and that it had been duly diligent. Both of these defenses were rejected by the court. Uh, Sunrise had argued that it was impossible for it to comply with the unreasonable deadlines set out in the order, especially given the vast scope of the cleanup work. It also argued that it did not have the financial ability to comply until it received the funds from its insurer. Uh, the court rejected the collateral attacks on the reasonableness of the order. It said that if Sunrise wanted to challenge the reasonableness of the order, it should have done so through the administrative law process, through an appeal to the director or to the ERT. Uh, so the court also emphasized that the defendants had a continuing compliance obligation. Even where the deadline had passed, they still had an obligation to comply. It concluded that Sunrise had failed to show that it was not physically or morally able to comply. 
With respect to the defense of due diligence, the court found that Sunrise was operating in an inherently dangerous activity, and as such, a preventative system was particularly important. It completely rejected Sunrise's arguments that it had been duly diligent and noted a number of issues, particularly the failure to stop truck to truck transfers, the failure to bring the site into compliance with TSSA requirements, failure to provide oversight of truck drivers, and a failure to implement an adequate preventative maintenance system. As a result, Sunrise received some of the highest fines ever imposed under the EPA. With respect to the Section 14 charges, this is the discharge of a contaminant causing an adverse effect, Sunrise was fined $4 million, divided equally between, between two related companies who effectively acted as one. There was a risk the fine could have been even higher. At sentencing, the Crown argued that because there was no comparable case due to the sheer magnitude of the incident, that a fine of $6 million would have been appropriate. With respect to the non-compliance with the order, the court accepted the Crown's request for a fine of 820000 Turning to the charges against the directors, uh, directors and officers' liability can arise in a number of ways. Uh, they may be issued in administrative orders on the basis that they have management and control of a property or undertaking. They may also be prosecuted as principals to the offense or for failing to fulfill their duties under the EPA. This includes, as I mentioned earlier, uh, ensuring that the company does not uh, fail to comply with environmental orders uh, and failing to ensure that the uh, company does not discharge a contaminant causing an adverse effect. In Sunrise Propane, each director was fined $100,000 for their role in failing to prevent the, the company from, uh, from contravening the order. And I think part of the reason for these charges against the director may have been their decision to use the funds that the company had available in order to try to continue to operate rather than complying with the order. There was evidence that there were about, was about $1.4 million in the company's accounts and they chose to spend that on um, paying their suppliers and trying to continue their other, to operate their other sites rather than uh, continuing the cleanup work. It's also important to note that insurance coverage for this kind of directors and officers liability is uncertain and depends on the policy. And if that was not enough, uh, in addition to the risk of legal action by the Ministry of the Environment following an environmental crisis, there's also the potential for civil claims brought by those impacted by the incident. Uh, these civil actions are grounded in the classic four toxic torts, nuisance, negligence, trespass, and strict liability under Rollins and Fletcher. There is also a, a statutory cause of action under the EPA to obtain compensation for damages caused by the spill of a pollutant. Uh, this was recently used successfully for the first time in a case called Midwest and Thorderson, which I'm happy to discuss in more detail, but I see I'm running out of time. Uh, the gist of it is uh, the, defendant and corporation, uh, the defendant corporation and the principal were both held to be jointly and severally liable for $1.3 million in remediation costs as well as $50,000 in punitive damages issue, issued against each of them. Uh, in the Sunrise Propane case, a class action was commenced against 15 defendants, essentially everyone with a connection to the incident. The class action was certified against all of the defendants for the personal injuries and property damage suffered by the plaintiffs. Although, with one exception, the claim against the landlord was only um, certified in respect, with respect to a claim in negligence. In 2013 and 2014, the parties engaged in global settlement negotiations mediated by Chief Justice Warren Winkler, a former Chief Justice at that time. The settlement was approved by the court in 2014 uh, for a total se settlement amount of almost $24 million. In addition to the liabilities we've already discussed, environmental crises can also result in a number of other costs and liabilities, including prosecution for health and safety violations, Sunrise Propane was fined $280,000 for failing in their duties as an employer. Where a municipality undertakes the remedial work following a spill, they have the power under the EPA to recover the costs uh, of remediating that spill through an order. They can also undertake uh, a civil action, which is exactly what the City of Toronto did against Sunrise Propane. Uh, they issued an order and a civil claim to recover the $2.8 million that they had spent on the cleanup. Uh, they settled for 400000 as part of the global settlement agreement. There are also an, numerous business impacts, uh, an inability to operate during the cleanup and repair. Other sites may be shut down by the regulator. 
It's a loss in property value and as well as reputational damages when an accident of this severity occurs. In addition, there are administrative, legal, and expert costs associated with responding to an incident like this. In Sunrise Propane's case, the, this was made even more difficult because all of their records were destroyed in the explosion. To, to conclude, um, given the potentially devastating impacts of a major environmental incident, it is important to be responsive to any warning signs. There has generally been some indication of environmental or safety issues before an incident in the form of noncompliance with regulatory standards and orders, issues identified in inspections or compliance audits, or even a, a lack of preventative measures such as compliance audits, which could assist in uh, anticipating problems before they occurred. It can be a warning sign if those things aren't happening. Uh, in, in a general culture of accepting noncompliance, which may be seen as trivial, but in hindsight, you can see that it was a quite a significant non issue. Uh, in Sunrise, the court emphasized that in a highly regulated, inherently dangerous industry, preventative systems are critical. So good enough for minor noncompliance is not duly diligent. Fortunately, Alex's presentation I know is full of ideas and recommendations on emergency preparedness and response measures. So with that, I'll turn it over to him. Oh, yes. Well, thank, thank you, Meredith. Um, and Meredith is correct. After the doom and gloom of uh, uh, Lloyd's uh, p painting of the picture and the, the universe in which we're living, and perhaps we'll all agree that our individual ability to solve issues like climate change that might spark a crisis in, in any of our environments uh, might be limited. Uh, and the perhaps not ideal circumstances in which Sunrise Pro Propane found themselves Alec McWilliam, uh, also from Denton's, but from our Calgary office, is going to come and talk about what do you do about it? How can, um, how can all of us and all of you and how can we help you avoid the type of situation in which Sun Sunrise found, found itself? Um, Alec uh, leads the Denton's Canada environmental practice. Uh, he, like Meredith, has a broad-based environmental practice and it advises in all legal issues related to the environment. He's widely regarded as one of the leading environmental practitioners in Alberta. And in 2012, he was appointed by the government of Alberta to the Environmental Appeals Board on which he continues to sit. So without further delay, I will turn it over to Alec. Thanks, Kate. Good morning, everybody. Uh, to my uh, fellow Albertans that are uh, tuned in to the webinar, uh, I definitely appreciate the fact that you logged onto your computers at 6 a.m. this morning in order to, uh, to hear our presentation. I uh, hope you're able to go back to sleep uh, after we're done. But, uh, um, I, uh, I, I've been doing environmental law uh, exclusively for about 25 years and, and it's interesting to sort of see the I guess what I would call the historic development of uh, emergency response and crisis management uh, I think when I was first getting involved in this area and uh, judging by the the uh, companies that are represented here and the positions of, of uh, the people in the audience uh, you, you're probably familiar with this as well things were dealt with uh, to a large degree on a reactive basis. Something bad would happen, and uh, then you'd go into response mode. And uh, typically, I would only learn about a problem after it had occurred, and the phone would ring, and then we would have to assist the client in, in dealing with it. And they'd be dealing with it on that basis, on a reactive basis. What I have seen over, over time and what has developed uh, is a more proactive approach to uh, planning for emergencies, to planning for a crisis that could affect your business and being set up so that you can deal with it as effectively as you can when it arises. Uh, and you never know when it's going to arise. That's what turns things into, into a crisis. Um, the other uh, thing that's that's developed is, and really this this in, this uh, 
uh, emphasis on, on prevention, obviously. Ideally, you want to prevent uh, these things from occurring. A lot of them, as Lloyd pointed out, are matters over which uh, we have no control. Uh, Mother Nature uh, is quite fickle, and uh, there's nothing you can do sometimes to, uh, to convince Mother Nature to leave you alone. Uh, but you also see this reflected in the approach that governments, regulators have taken, uh, and also the development of the common law, what, what is expected of corporations and their management, what is deemed by the courts to be reasonable in terms of planning uh, for uh, an event, uh, an untoward event, and how you're going to respond to it. So that's, we've seen this shift from being purely reactive to a much more proactive approach. And, and quite frankly, as, as a lawyer, I much prefer dealing with clients on the proactive basis than on the reactive basis. I would much prefer getting involved with them at an earlier stage and hopefully being, uh, being helping them get to a point where they never have to call me on an emergency basis. So you saw in, in Lloyd's uh, presentation uh, uh, an exam or, or descriptions of the increased frequency and severity of, of uh, particularly natural uh, types of uh, disasters or emergencies. Uh, I've just listed uh, some other uh, sources. I'm sure when you look at those bullet points, you can all think of particular incidents that have arisen uh, with companies that you're familiar with. Uh, or parts of the world where, where things have occurred that uh, you're aware of that would fall in, into uh, all those uh, categories. And as uh, the quote at the top illustrates, we're not dealing with uh, sort of good versus bad. It's simply what happens when you've got a bad situation. How do you uh, prevent it from becoming a catastrophe? The other thing that's important to know about, about uh, crisis management and crises in general is that uh, they are inevitable. And you can see from these statistics here that uh, it's something that is likely to hit every business. It's not a question of if you will have a crisis at some point in your company's history. Uh, it's the question is when. And uh, you can see that uh, the typical types of, or the, the most frequent types of crises relate to uh, failures to comply, uh, natural disasters, some sort of uh, tort or accident, and uh, environmental crises along the lines of, of, of what uh, Meredith was talking about. I had a partner uh, in our Edmonton office for many years. She's now a judge on the Court of Queen's bench in Alberta. And she used to describe these situations as the great unpleasantness. And uh, she said that, uh, you know, it's, uh, you're preparing for the great unpleasantness. Uh, you can try as hard as you can, and you're expected to, and you're required to, by law, do everything reasonable it's in the circumstances to prevent the great unpleasantness from occurring. But uh, it is inevitable. And then the question is, are you, are you in a position to defend your company's conduct? pre-incident, and are you in a position to properly respond when the great unpleasantness occurs? And these have just listed um, the, uh, the common elements uh, of a crisis. So these are all the sorts of things that you uh, will see. Uh, again, there may be uh, differing degrees of, of each of these in, in context of a particular incident. Uh, I think it's safe to say that a crisis never occurs on a slow day. Uh, it never occurs when you want it to occur. Uh, and uh, that's why Henry Kissinger's uh, saying, I can't, uh, we can't have a crisis uh, next week because my schedule is already full. Now, unfortunately, uh, crises uh, do not uh, respond to people's individual schedules. The other thing that's important to realize is that particularly these days, and I'm going to illustrate this a little bit further in my presentation, uh, corporations are under a very big magnifying glass. Corporations, the activities that they carry on, particularly if they have risks associated with them, 
uh, are you're being watched very closely. So when something happens, it just focuses and magnifies that attention even more. And I think the last bullet uh, uh, um, on this slide kind of goes back to the uh, the title of, of my presentation, which is uh, "Be quick with the facts and slow with the blame." Uh, things are never quite the way they seem to be initially when a crisis happens. And one of the hardest parts is trying to get a handle on what actually occurred. There's a lot of information or misinformation flying around that ties into the whole uh, area of communication, which I'm going to talk about later. But trying to get a handle on the facts before you start to determine what the cause was or who was responsible for the events that led to the crisis uh, is critical. So what, what turns an incident into a, uh, a crisis? We love to use the term uh, incident or event, uh, but uh, typically in, in a lot of cases we're talking about emerg an emergency situation or something that could escalate uh, in, in its intensity. That's really the key, uh, an, ex an escalation of the impacts of this particular incident or event can turn something from an incident into a crisis. Uh, media attention, obviously, is something that can rapidly uh, get out of control and uh, cause the situation to escalate. And uh, the impacts to a corporation's reputation and to uh, the shareholders' uh, interests, their value in the corporation, uh, can also um, escalate, or in this case, I guess, deteriorate rapidly, turning something that is an event or an incident into a crisis. And as I alluded to a minute ago, uh, we're in a different world now than we were when I first started practicing uh, environmental law uh, ages ago. Um, the, the speed uh, with which information, misinformation, impressions, rumors uh, circulates is instantaneous. Uh, there are events that have occurred while we've been sitting in this room that uh, we don't know about yet because we haven't been looking at our, at our phones, but there will be uh, a crisis somewhere in the world today that we will all know about uh, as soon as we turn our, turn our phones back on. Uh, you've heard reference to the 24-hour news cycle, uh, and you've, you've all looked at CNN and other networks that love to come up with a title uh, right away, and then that's what gets repeated over and over. And there, because there's this need to feed the news machine on a 24-hour constant basis, uh, things uh, get uh, get escalated, and to a large degree get overblown. In order to do that, uh, this whole idea of the crisis du jour uh, uh, is uh, is endemic. I guess if there's good news in that, it's that um, because there has to be a crisis du jour and people's attention span um, abates uh, rather quickly, you can pretty much guarantee that your crisis will be taken off the front page by somebody else's crisis uh, in fairly short order. The bad news is that while you are the crisis du jour, uh, you will have uh, unrelenting attention focused on you, both in terms of what's happening, what the effects of this have been, and uh, all sorts of uh, allegations and illusions uh, as to what, uh, what was the cause. The, uh, uh, the, the public doesn't trust uh, the corporate world, uh, so there's always a jaded uh, response to whatever actions you might take to deal with a crisis, no, no matter how, how innocent and well-meaning they are, they're always looked at with a jaundiced eye by, uh, by the public. Uh, the, um, there, there, are more, there are more unofficial and official agencies that are acting as watchdogs uh, on corporate activity. Uh, lots of NGOs uh, spend a lot of time looking at particular sectors of the economy that they're concerned with or sectors of the economy that can have impacts uh, in areas of interest to them, in my case, uh, the environment. So you've got, a, and you've got a lot of uh, regulatory bodies that you're beholden to that might be permitting 
uh, or allowing your activity to carry on in the first place that you have to be aware of that are going to be looking at you uh, in the event that there's some sort of uh, incident. So this is, this is one definition of crisis management, and there are, there are many. This one defines crisis management as being the management and coordination of your institution's responses to an incident that threatens to harm or has harmed your institution's people, structures, ability to operate, valuables, and or reputation. Uh, it's important to realize that crisis management includes both um, pre-incident planning and incident response processes uh, it also involves reacting to unanticipated situations as they as they arise. So there's no there's no one size fits all uh, crisis management uh, plan. These are these are just examples in, from my experience as to what you would typically see in a in a corporate crisis management plan, identifying who the players are within your organization. In some cases, companies that operate. Uh, in many jurisdictions will have a team that's comprised of people from across Canada. And you may have an initial incident response team that would, be, that would consist of local people who would be responsible for stabilizing and, and collecting initial information. And then you have the, the shock troops coming in from other parts of, of, uh, of the country. Uh, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a real military approach to these things, not surprisingly. Uh, military tend to operate uh, in situations of crisis frequently. So you, you, you'll see if you've been involved in any of these or if, you, if you've got your own uh, plan within your organization and it looks somewhat military in its organization in terms of the way titles are assigned and roles are, are handed out, it, command centers being defined, all those sorts of things. Um, the other thing that's important to realize is you can't develop a crisis management plan until you understand what it is you're planning for. And it sounds sort of tautological, but when you think about it, if you don't have a very in-depth knowledge of your operations and all the risks that are associated with it, you can't really develop a plan to respond to a crisis that could, could result from one of these risks coming true. Again, you've also, you're also planning for natural disasters and things that really have nothing to do with your operations, but the nature of your operations may dictate how a natural disaster could impact uh, those operations and, and, uh, and the company itself. So if there's one uh, message, there's a number of points on here uh, that, that I'd like you to take out of this when, when, when the great unpleasantness does occur. It's that communication is key. And by communication, I mean both internal communication and external communication. That is that w w frequently, and you've probably all seen documentaries or perhaps had presentations or read articles on various types of crises that have occurred in the past and where the company went wrong. And in, more often than not, it's with respect to communication, either a failure to communicate or a failure to communicate honestly or a uh, communication uh, at, a, at a stage when all the facts weren't known. That's really where things can go wrong. I put in at the bottom, uh, apologize if appropriate. Almost all the provinces in Canada now have what's called uh, sorry legislation or apology legislation. In some provinces, it's an actual statute. In others, it's put into a statute. For example, in Alberta, it's a section in the Alberta Evidence Act. But, but they all basically say the same thing, which is if you apologize for something, it's not deemed to be any express or implied admission of liability or fault or responsibility. So you can do that. So you can, you can step forward right off the bat and say, we are very sorry that this incident occurred at our facility. Uh, we apologize to anybody who's been impacted by it without fear that that can be used against you. But you only do that if it's appropriate, if in fact it is something that, uh, that you may be responsible for or you may be uh, whether it's legally responsible, you may feel a moral obligation to do that as, as well. This is a, a slightly outdated statistic. It's 2011. Uh, I couldn't find an updated one, but in, in my experience, I don't think that this number has changed all that much. And it's, it's kind of a, a shocking uh, statistic when you think about almost a third of organizations um, 
are only a third of organizations actually have a, a CMP that would that would work in the event of a of an actual crisis. These priorities are listed in, in descending order of importance, and I think they're just, to a large degree, are, are common sense. Your first order of priority is to make sure that the first responders that are coming out to deal with it uh, are safe and that their health is not endangered uh, as a result of this. Uh, and then secondly, you're wanting to save lives generally, reduce suffering, protect the public, and then you eventually get down to preserving assets and uh, reducing uh, the economic costs of, of, your, uh, of the incident. And again, these are, these are just sort of tips that I, I, would, I throw out as a result of dealing with these sorts of issues for, for clients over, over uh, a number of decades. Um, I like uh, the truth is easier to remember. Um, so, uh, and, and I also uh, give the same admonishment in here uh, as I would give to anybody who's about to testify in any sort of proceeding, which is don't speculate or prevaricate. If you don't know the answer, say you don't know, but you will get back to whoever it is that's asking the question as soon as you have that information. No comment. You've probably all seen the dangers of somebody just saying no comment uh, is, not, is not a good way to go these days. Uh, a lot of organizations, in, including our own, uh, provides media training. Uh, we are not supposed to talk to the media unless we have been media trained. Uh, that's our, our firm policy. Uh, obviously, it's different for uh, legal counsel because in most cases, we can't talk about something because it's a confidential matter involving one of our clients. But if it was a matter involving our law firm, uh, and uh, we're asked to comment on it. Uh, we're not supposed to be doing that unless we've gone through our media training program. And I suspect that most of you are in organizations where that's, that is the case. And there's nothing wrong with you saying, uh, I'm not able to respond to this, but I will put you in touch with one of our communications people. Those are the ones who've had the training, and uh, they are the ones that should be dealing with, with inquiries. I like that Churchill comment. Um, I'm, I, c I confirmed it with a number of sources on the internet that it comes from Churchill, but uh, he's, he's such a great source of quotes and uh, it's a pretty good one, but I'm not guaranteeing that it was actually spoken by him. How's that for a lawyer answer? Uh, paper, documents, critical uh, approach to, uh, uh, or a critical issue when it comes to dealing with um, uh, a crisis. You heard, you heard Meredith talk about Sunrise Propane, one of, the, one of the problems that it had, uh, among the many problems that it had in establishing a due diligence defense is that the documents that it would have put forward to substantiate its due diligence defense, the due diligence defense being doing everything reasonable in the circumstances to prevent whatever the, the act was from occurring, were destroyed in the explosion and fire. So a lot of that relates to just where you store your key and critical documents. So there's the, there's the pre-incident documents, and then there's the post-incident uh, documents. There's a lot of paper that gets generated. And when you look at a crisis management plan and you see how the, the, the system is structured, it's uh, quite common that there will be a specific unit, a specific division of the, of the team whose role is to do nothing but look after all the paper that gets generated during uh, a response to a crisis, whether it's something as simple as a purchase order for some equipment that you need brought in on a, on a uh, emergency basis, because you want to be able to document those costs later on if you're going to be making insurance claims or claims against other parties that might be responsible for the incident, or it can be something as key as uh, witness statements from people who were, who were involved uh, immediately at the time of the incident. You've got to be able to document what's happened, and you've got to be able to make sure that those documents are preserved and, uh, and kept in a proper, uh, proper format. There is a role uh, for legal counsel to play uh, in crisis management, both prior to the crisis and after, and I talked a little bit about the, about the uh, proactive approach that companies are taking, and lawyers can be involved in that, and, and, and one of the key things that we bring to that pre-crisis is that we are trained to identify and assess risks. So as you're going through the process of identifying 
what risks there are to your operations, either from external forces or internal um, incidents or, or accidents that might occur. Lawyers can be, can be very helpful in that. Plus, they also uh, understand or should understand what the legal and regulatory requirements are uh, on, your, on, on your operations. Um, it may be that you have, uh, you have a legal obligation under a particular statute to have an emergency response plan. So you've got to make sure you've got that. Just you don't want to be non-compliant uh, when it comes to that because that just compounds the problem once there is an incident. And there's, I uh, got ahead of myself there, but there's an example or some examples of uh, pieces of legislation that uh, carry with them obligations to have emergency response plans. Some of you may be familiar with the E2 regulations under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. If you, if as a result of your operations, you have um, certain toxic substances above certain quantities or concentrations, you're required by law to have an emergency response plan to deal with a release of those. So uh, for companies, example, in the food preparation or food, food service business, uh, if you've got a major uh, manufacturing facility for food products and you use a lot of ammonia in the process for refrigeration, that could trigger an obligation under the E2 regulations to have a, an emergency response plan. Planning itself is more important than the actual document itself. It's no different than your compliance programs. Uh, you can have the best compliance program in the world, but if it sits in a binder up on somebody's shelf and nobody ever looks at it, it's not going to be of any assistance to you for two reasons. It's not going to work because nobody's going to know what to do because they haven't read it, they haven't been expected to read it, you're not auditing people, those sorts of things. And secondly, it's not going to assist you in trying to make a due diligence defense. Uh, mock disaster exercises are, are great uh, things to do. I've been involved with a number of them for uh, companies from refinery fires to explosions at gas plants and there's uh, consulting firms who do nothing but that and they're very good and these things usually take place over a couple of days and they hire actors who will show up unannounced uh, as uh, concerned relatives of plant employees wanting answers and you're, you're there trying to react to that. Uh, I always recommend to clients that if possible, they bring in regulators, their regulators, for example, could be the environmental, uh, provincial environmental department to observe their, uh, their disaster exercises. There's a little bit of reluctance to do that because everybody thinks, well, what happens if we, what happens if we screw up, even if it's just a, even if it's just a make-believe uh, disaster. Uh, my experience is that it's much better to have that experience uh, to perhaps uh, demonstrate uh, the need for a better training and a better plan in front of your regulator and then obviously carry out uh, steps to fix the problems than it is to uh, fail uh, in front of the regulator in a real life situation. And they, they, they appreciate very much being brought into the scenarios and it's key that when you have your debriefing sessions, which can typically take many hours after you finish your exercise, that you get input from the fire department or the uh, transportation authorities if it's a dangerous goods incident or Health Canada, if that's your regulator. Again, uh, lawyers should not be driving the process when you actually have a, a crisis. We should not be the ones who are telling people what to do and what not to do. We should be involved in the process, but we definitely should not be the ones that are, are, are leading it. Uh, but we can provide a lot of assistance, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, discharging your regulatory obligations. Uh, you may have a lot of contracts that have force majeure provisions in, notices have to be given, all those sorts of things, and assisting but not driving your communication plan. You've got communication people or you've got consultants that you've hired as a result of this incident. They're the experts. The lawyers are there quite often. What we'll do is we may review press releases and things before they go out and provide comments, but we do not, we do not write them at all, or we shouldn't be. And then obviously if there are things that you want to maintain privilege over, you've got to have, uh, or you should have your legal counsel involved in that. Again, that just carries on with some more. Last, uh, last thing I've, I've put there is really just a, I, I've called it a counsel's toolkit, but it's not, it's not restricted to legal counsel. It could be anybody who's involved in uh, crisis management, emergency 
response planning, whether you're a risk manager or a DHS person. These are these are just some some good lists and things to have as part of your uh, resources. It's not this is not a crisis management plan. This is just kind of your your little uh, quick uh, dirty cheat sheet that you might have at your at uh, your fingertips in order to help you responding once the great unpleasantness occurs. So that's it. I'm going to sit down and then Kate, I think, will field or, or be the quarterback when it comes to uh, any questions that anybody might have. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Alec. Um, we will throw it open to questions. I am afraid that I will have to look at my iPhone as we go along, but maybe we'll start in the room. Are there any questions? Moment. I have one for Alec. As he pours a glass of water. Alec, you right. talked about um, the law a lawyer shouldn't be responsible. Who, who are the types of people in an organization if, if an organization is trying to identify the, the uber lord, if we want to call it that, for the purposes of a crisis management plan, who should they be thinking about as being primarily responsible? Well, it, it shouldn't be the person that's highest up on the uh, corporate uh, ladder, uh, it's, unless that is the appropriate person. Uh, so it's really who is best equipped to lead the, uh, the, the response. In some cases, if you're dealing with a particular facility, it might be the facility manager, uh, it might be the uh, head of EH and S. Uh, it's, it's interesting, the ones I've been involved in, when I've been brought in, I, I've been surprised occasionally to find out who the incident commander is, because I would have thought, and, and the incident commander controls things. So that person, he or she, may be directing somebody who's higher up in the ordinary corporate food chain. They may be telling them what to do. And, and, and I, initially, I found that a little odd, and maybe people within the corporation did too. But it's, it's who's got the training, who's obviously good at, who, uh, who's got a calm head under, uh, in a crisis. We all have people we work with who are great at what they do, but if you were asked whether that's the person you thought that should be leading the team in the event of a crisis, you'd go, no, there's no way. That's just going to escalate things. So there's no, there's no standard answer to that. And I've, I've seen people right at the top, and I've also seen people fairly uh, mid-level being the ones who take control. And then typically, depending on how a crisis unfolds, you've got a, you've got a B team and a C team that come in and take over as, as, as the first team gets worn out, frankly. All right, well, I've got one for Meredith. <laughs> if nobody else does, I'm, I'm, I love to have a microphone, so be warned. Um, Meredith, you were talking about in Sunrise Propane, the due diligence defense, and Alec had stressed the importance in, in his presentation as well uh, about um, having good paper and record keeping. And I understand that there may have been a bit of a hiccup for Sunrise Propane when they raised their due diligence defense around that record keeping. And rather than steal your thunder, do you, do you want to describe that? I'm not, I mean, I, they're all gone. Keeping the paper. Yes. Because <laughs> the, I mean, the whole facility had exploded, so there was really nothing left. Is that what you're meaning? Yes. Okay. Do you want to comment on that? That is probably a good... Oh, actually, I, uh, I don't know if people know this or not, but Diane Sachs' office burned down a couple, many, many years ago. So when I first started with her, we had a triple backup of all of our records. So I think there are a lot of tools available for you to electronically store your files so that you have a backup record in, in addition to any paper copies that you're keeping. So. And, and certainly as a preventive measure, mm -hmm. uh, Sunrise found themselves caught by, you know, it's, it's a basic, um, uh, you know, we're all taught to keep your insurance policy in a fireproof box in your house. I, I think the same, the same uh, principles apply and Sunrise paid the price for not having having done that, because when they tried to mount their defense, they just couldn't because they didn't have the records available. And, and there was, the Ministry of the Environment tried to sort of take the tack that it was fortunate they didn't have their records so that they could make this argument, well, you know, you have to, that they tried to make the Ministry prove that they had not been duly diligent, but the, the courts didn't, didn't accept that. The burden of proof to establish a due diligence defense is on the defendant. Some of you uh, may remember Y2K. Um, I, 
thankfully, I don't think any of us are going to have to worry about why 3K, but uh, I, I remember that we had a backup system set up in some warehouse up near the Calgary airport in the event that our computers went down and we lost everything on January 1st, 2000. So the start of that, at least from our records, we're now much more sophisticated than that. I think there was a question there. Yeah. Alec, do you just want to repeat it? I don't know if you're going to take that or Meredith, but can you just repeat it for the... Um... Uh, the question related to uh, due diligence, but from the perspective of a financial uh, institution, so presumably somebody who's got mortgage security over a facility at which uh, uh, an incident occurs, is that... Yeah, yeah such as Sunrise. Um, the, uh, when it comes to, uh, and I'll, I'm... I'm if I'm incorrect as far as Ontario law goes, Meredith is going to correct me, but uh, the, the liability under the statute in terms of responsibility for the incident would not lie with, with a lender. Uh, it may be that uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to cleanup, you may have, I'm looking at Meredith, she's not kicking me yet. I'm just, I'm going on my Alberta experience. Uh, you may have some responsibility if the company's gone under, you've taken, you've taken uh, possession of the property. Uh, typically, if you do nothing to make the situation worse, you shouldn't be responsible going forward. But I think the lesson to, to be learned if you're a financial institution, and most of them follow this in any event, is if you're lending to somebody who has a facility at which they're carrying on a, a operation that has some sort of environmental risks associated with it, you've got your lengthy pre-mortgage pre, uh, checklists and all those other things that you go through to try to assess that risk. And I know you're assessing it to a large degree from a credit worthiness perspective, but, but the banks are also looking at it from an environmental management I guess uh, perspective as well so that's all but you're not you're not typically going to be forced to mount a due diligence defense because you're not typically going to be a, a party that the uh, uh, enforcement agencies are going to turn their uh, guns on I would just say that I mean in terms of this, the ability for the regulator to issue an order against a financial institution, that would only arise if they took possession of the site. And as Alec mentioned, uh, under the EPA, there are specific activities that um, a creditor in possession can undertake at the site. But I, I think in an, in an insolvency context, there would likely be a court-appointed receiver who would manage the site rather than the financial of the bank taking control directly. Um, and there, in that case, there's a whole body of case law around the priority of an environmental order in an insolvency context, whether or not it's a, a claim in the proceedings or not, which is longer and more complicated than we probably can't get into it today, but I'd be happy to discuss afterwards. Other questions? I've got one for Lloyd, and then... So, I asked Alec, you know, who's the person? I'm going to ask you a very fundamental question, is where does an organization start? They call you up and they say, we need a plan. How do they even start down the road of putting a plan together of the kind that Alec has described should be in place? Um, in a lot of cases, I guess it's... Um how they're going to be looking to respond to regulatory requirements, permitting or whatever, in a lot of cases, almost sets the stage for do they need to have a plan? Um, so, you know, it's like the permit process, the EA process in many cases um, kind of sets the stage. Um, you know, this is one of the things that you need to be able to provide. Um, you know, trying to exercise due diligence. In a lot of cases, it may initially start out of out from a uh, environmental health and safety requirement, and then it builds from there. So, w when you're working with your environmental consultants, it's going to be important to be working with them to identify those steps along the way and 
and putting the programs in place. Alec, it looks like you have something to well, add. Well, yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Lloyd said. Um, I, I think in, in, in terms of, certainly you, you want to make sure that you've got all the plans that you're required to have, that, that you're required to have by law or that you need in place in order to get your permit to carry on whatever your activity is. Um, I would recommend that you go beyond that. Uh, there may be, uh, there, there are lots of uh, organizations that are represented in, in the room and on, on uh, the webinar that, uh, to my knowledge, don't require permits in order to carry on their operations, but should have some sort of crisis management plan in place, because even though your activities may not carry inherent risks of the type that would require you to have some sort of permit to carry on operations, these external forces that, that, that Lloyd uh, summarized so well can occur. And uh, even if you're a, a financial institution, uh, if you're hit with a, uh, a flood, or if even if you're a law firm, uh, we were shut down for a week in Calgary uh, when, uh, well, I shouldn't say shut down, we all worked from home, but uh, our offices were closed for a week when the floods hit in 2013. They weren't damaged, but downtown Calgary was completely shut off and there was no power. So we had to, to operate, uh, we had to operate remotely. I don't know if my mic's in. Oh, there we go. We had to operate uh, remotely, but we had a plan in place, uh, not what well, we weren't expecting a flood. Nobody was expecting that, but we did have a plan in place that we could invoke uh, in, including call-outs to all of our staff and lawyers and those sorts of things. And because at the end of the day, uh, we had to put together a business interruption claim to make with our insurers, if we hadn't had that sort of plan, things would have been a lot worse, even though we don't really do anything that uh, carries with it any uh, uh, environmental risks, other than if we had a spill from one of our coffee machines. Uh, <laughs> As Alec was uh, kind of referring to, there's obviously in some cases stakeholders are a, a major contributor or force in developing uh, plans or the need for plans. Uh, re reaction to public awareness, uh, you know, the public at times may end up asking questions uh, and in responding to their questions uh, in order to improve their profile of the company. Uh, you know, that may stimulate the need to actually do something and put plans together. Thank you. Anybody else? We're getting, we're right up against time. We're pretty close to time. So if we don't have any other questions, I think we can uh, thank, sorry. Did you look at your phone? I've looked at my iPhone. We're good. <laughs> Uh, so I think thanks uh, to Alec and Meredith and, of course, to Lloyd as our uh, outside guest here today. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, I believe the webinar has been recorded and we will certainly make uh, the presentations available to you. And, um, of course, if we can ever be of help, that's what we're here for. Thanks for coming. <laughs>